Hello, I'm Ron Vale from UCSF, and in this part of my eye biology talk, I'd like to discuss the regulation of mammalian dynein, research that's come out of our lab as well as uh, others in the field. So we began uh, to do our research on dynein using yeast cytoplasmic dynein. And there were many reasons for this. It was easy to express large quantities of uh, yeast dynein. And we can also modify it to create different types of recombinant protein. And furthermore, when we tested yeast cytoplasmic dynein for single molecule motility, uh, we got this uh, type of fantastic motion that you see here. Again, all of these individual green spots are single molecules of dynein that are moving along microtubule tracks shown here in blue. So later, we wanted to extend our work uh, to mammalian dynein. And we thought it was, uh, this was work that Rick McKinney did, and we thought it was going to be fairly straightforward. We just do all the same things that we did with yeast and apply it to dynein from a different species. But unfortunately, the initial results were rather disappointing. So uh, we first tried to make a recombinant human dynein, very much like the type of recombinant dynein that we made with yeast. Uh, and the dyneins here are in red in this case, but we saw very little motility. They would bind to the microtubule, but did not move. So we took then a step back and decided to purify dynein from a, a native tissue, uh, from rat brain. So this is uh, the normal dynein from rat brain. And again, we purified it, we fluorescently labeled it, but again, found fairly disappointing results. We saw uh, dynein binding to the microtubule, but no movement. Um, however, these dyneins weren't completely inactive because we then tested them in another kind of motility assay uh, and, and saw that they, they could produce movement. And this is what's called a microtubule gliding assay. In this case, the dynein is coated and attached onto a glass uh, cover slip. It then grabs hold of a microtubule and then it can move it across the surface. So in this case, However, this is not single molecule motility. There are many dynein molecules underneath that microtubule. And these are the microtubules here. When you give it, give it ATP, they move very nicely across the glass. So uh, the conundrum was, why didn't we see any single molecule motility, uh, processive motility of the dynein? Um, we saw it in yeast, but we didn't see it in mammalian cells. And we expected the mammalian dynein also to be processive especially if it's going to carry cargo uh, for long distances inside of cells. Um, so when you get a negative result like this, one often has to go back to the drawing board and figure out, uh, well, maybe some, something wasn't right about the experiment. Maybe the conditions uh, for the assay weren't quite right, whatever buffers we were using or other elements of the assay. Um, or maybe we're just entirely missing some critical component that dynein needs to move at a single molecule level. So we began to test uh, this latter possibility. And a good candidate for that missing factor was uh, a protein complex uh, that was known as dynactin. Now, dynactin was discovered uh, many years ago by Schroer and colleagues as uh, a cofactor that would stimulate organelle transport by dynein. And subsequently, it's been found that dynactin is required for many functions of cytoplasmic dynein. Effectively, a knockout of dynactin produces a very similar phenotype to knocking out uh, dynein itself. So it seems to be involved in many kinds of dynein uh, functions, although the exact role of dynactin uh, has not been entirely clear. So this is what uh, dynactin looks like, and it's a monstrous protein of comparable size to dynein itself. It has about 23 proteins in one dynactin complex, and it's about a megadalton in size. And it has a very uh, interesting and unusual architecture. Uh, the core of dynactin is composed of a short uh, filament of actin-related proteins that are capped at uh, both ends by a different group of uh, special capping proteins. And in the middle, uh, there's a, another uh, group of proteins that create a, a, a type of shoulder in, on uh, one part of the dynein, a dynactin molecule. And there's uh, a long co coil that extends from this core structure uh, called P150 that also contains a microtubule binding domain at the end. 
Now recently there's also been some uh, exciting developments because uh, the Andrew Carter's lab recently got a cryo-EM structure of uh, Dynactin. So we now know the organization of all these uh, subunits uh, uh, through their work at near atomic resolution. Um, so, but the conundrum is for many years, although it was known that Dyn and Dynactin are involved in cellular activities together, it was very hard to demonstrate a biochemical interaction between uh, dynein and Dynactin. Um, but this mystery was uh, resolved when another protein came on the scene uh, called bicaudal D or Bic D. Now Bic D is a much smaller protein and it's composed of several uh, coil coils here. It was originally discovered uh, in a Drosophila genetic screen by Eric Vishaus and Christian uh, Nusland Volhard, and subsequently it was shown that this Bic D is involved in recruiting dynein uh, to membrane organelles. Uh, and an important piece of work was done uh, in this paper by Splinter and colleagues where they showed that this big D can join dynein and dynactin now into a stable interacting complex. And this was shown in the sucrose gradient here where all three of these components are combined. And they co-migrate together in a very large molecular weight complex. This top band is dynein. This is the P150 subunit of dynactin. And this lower band is uh, this big D. So they, they all co-migrate together uh, on the sucrose gradient. So we think they're interacting all together in one large complex. And in fact, with the recent cryo-EM work, we actually have some idea why uh, and how big D can join dynein and dynactin together. It basically, this is work from Andrew Carter's lab, sits in between them. It First of all, uh, the coil, coil of big D falls along a groove in uh, the actin filament of dynactin, but it also makes contact with dynein as well. So it kind of serves as a glue to bring these two proteins together and sits in the middle. And uh, also uh, work uh, from Chowdhury et al. from an, another laboratory uh, imaged this dynein dynactin big D complex on the microtubule. And uh, you can see the dynein motor domain here, in this case just kind of uh, uh, colored in yellow carrying this huge entourage behind it, which is this complex of dynactin and, and big D. So it, it's really an amazingly large uh, collection of proteins here that are connected to the dynein motor domains. Well, going back in time now to 2013, we were interested whether this complex would convert dynein from that non-processive motor that I showed you to a processive motor. So, uh, Rick McKinney purified this complex. Uh, he also tagged the BIC-D uh, with a GFP, and in this case we just used the N-terminus of BIC-D, which was sufficient to combine all these proteins together. And uh, to our great satisfaction, there was uh, tremendously good processive movement of this entire complex. So here, all these, again, all these individual green dots are the big D, which are traveling along the microtubules due to the interaction with dynein and dynactin. In fact, uh, this is one of the most processive uh, motors that we've studied. Uh, in, in fact, it's about five to ten times more processive uh, than the kinesin motor. So this converted this motor from uh, this very poor uh, motor for single molecule motility into a real champion processive motor here. Um, so uh, uh, this same observation was also made uh, by uh, uh, Andrew Carter's lab independently, uh, specifically by uh, Max uh, Schlager. So um, we now also wanted to uh, be sure that all these protein components were indeed interacting and traveling together on the microtubule. So we then did this experiment where we labeled each of the components with a, a different fluorescent dye. So GFP was tagged uh, with a green dye, uh, big D, a blue dye, and dynactin uh, with a red dye. And you can see when you superimpose uh, all these colors, you get these really nice multicolored spots over here. And I'll feature this for one spot in detail where you can see uh, all three components moving together 
uh, along a microtubule. And the reason why these colors appear separated is that the microscope is first taking uh, a snapshot in, in green, and then another one in red, and another one in blue. And in between taking these different colored snapshots, of course, the dynein continues to move along the microtubule, which is why uh, these colors appear to be separated. Um, uh, but that's just due to the way that these images were acquired. So the next thing we wanted to know was whether this was some unique mechanism uh, of BIC-D, or did this reflect a more general uh, mechanism of how you activate dynein processivity inside of cells? Um, so uh, to answer this question, I need to give you a bit of a more explanation of uh, BIC-D and how it interacts with other molecules in the cell. So I just described to you how the N-terminus of BIC-D can join dynactin and dynein into this one protein complex. But BIC-D also has uh, another coil coil at the C-terminus. And this C-terminal part of the coil coil interacts with another protein, which is a Rab GTPase. And this Rab GTPase is docked onto the surface of uh, a membrane vesicle. So this big D really acts as an adapter protein. At one end, it's connected to a cargo. Uh, in this case, is Rab6 protein uh, from the Golgi. Uh, at the other end, it's interacting uh, with the dynein motor and dynactin. So it's really bridging and bringing the, the, the dynein-dynactin complex normally in a cell to a specific cargo. Now, in the dynein literature, it was known that there were other types of adapter proteins that served other functions. Some seem to be linking dynein onto endosomes. Uh, the spindly protein uh, brings dynein to kinetochores. So what we wanted to know is, do all these other adapter proteins described in the literature, could they also convert dynein and dynactin into a processive motor? So we purified these other adapters and tested them in the single molecule assay, and again, uh, found this uh, very gratifying, beautiful movement uh, where all of these adapter proteins can form a complex with dynein dynactin and, um, and uh, induce highly processive dynein motility. Now, in addition to regulating dynein, it also appears that this big D can regulate uh, dynactin as well. Remember that I said at the, at the end of this little antenna subunit here, P150, there's a microtubule binding domain. But what we found with single molecule studies, if we looked at microtubule binding by uh, dynactin alone, uh, or even dynactin with uh, dynein, we found that dynactin really uh, had very, very low binding to the microtubule, suggesting that this microtubule binding domain is somehow uh, repressed. Uh, but when it's combined with big D and, and, and dynein, um, the microtubule binding uh, of the this dynactin component uh, increases. So, um, as I'll explain more later on in this talk, so it appears as though this complex formation also is able uh, to convert uh, the microtubule binding uh, activity of dynactin from a repressed uh, to an active form. So the general model that's emerging from these in vitro studies is that uh, perhaps in the cytoplasm, when dynein is not attached to a cargo, uh, and dynactin is not attached to a cargo, these molecules are, are largely inactivated. Um, uh, and that the activation of these molecules requires, is linked to their simultaneous binding to a cargo. So in, the, in, in this case, there's a cargo molecule with a receptor um, that uh, can bind to an adapter protein. In some cases, we think it actually can activate that adapter protein. And that adapter protein then uh, brings dynein dynactin onto the surface of the cargo and also activates it so that the motor is now active and can transport that cargo along the microtubule track. So uh, I showed you now how the cargo can regulate uh, dynein dynactin motility. What about the microtubules themselves? Are they just uh, kind of inert tracks? Or do they have a regulatory function as well? Well, it's known that microtubules actually have many different types of post-translational modifications. Um, so 
these modifications are described here, and they often occur on the very C terminus. Uh, these, uh, this, these somewhat disordered peptides that emerge from the main surface of the microtubule. And I'd like to focus on one of these uh, post-translational modifications, which is, uh, involves the very C terminal tyrosine of the alpha tubulin subunit. So it turns out that the, the C terminus has this tyrosine residue, but in cells there's an enzyme, a carboxypeptidase, that can remove that, uh, specifically remove that tyrosine residue. And in fact, post-translationally again, there's an enzyme, a tubulin tyrosine ligase, that can uh, shift the reaction in the opposite direction and re-add that, uh, that tyrosine to the end of alpha tubulin. So this modification has been known for many years. It's not clear exactly what it's doing in cells, but uh, cell biological studies have shown that um, these types of microtubule tracts, in fact, can be separate uh, even inside of one cell. So for example, this shows an image of a fibroblast which is migrating, it's polarized, it's extending and moving in one direction. And it was found that the microtubules that are extending in the direction of movement are uh, preferentially detyrosinated. So it's been tempting to speculate that these different types of microtubule tracts uh, that are tyrosinated and detyrosinated may serve uh, and interact differently with different types of molecular motor proteins in cells, although um, evidence for that hasn't been entirely clear. So we decided to test that, whether the C-terminus of the tyrosine makes a difference or not for the processive motility of dynein and dynactin connected to uh, this BIC-D. So we made, first of all, recombinant tubulin that was absolutely identical except for one difference, whether the alpha tubulin had the tyrosine or not. And second of all, then, we labeled those two different types of microtubules in different, with different fluorescent dyes. So the tyrosinated microtubules you'll see in the movie that I'll show you uh, are labeled with a red dye, whereas we uh, labeled the detyrosinated tubulin with a blue dye. And then we just combined these two microtubule types together uh, in the same cover slip and then examined how they would interact with different molecules. So uh, first of all, we, we tested just the P150 domain of dynactin. So this is not the whole dynactin molecule. It's basically uh, the microtubule uh, binding uh, portion of dynactin. And uh, this was actually known earlier, and we replicated the results, that you can see all these dynactin molecules uh, found in green uh, decorating uh, these red microtubule tracts. But these blue microtubule tracts that don't have the tyrosine are devoid of the, uh, the P150 microtubule binding region. We tested this also for, for dynein. Uh, again, labeled in green. And remember, dynein on its own does not really move along microtubules, so we're just examining here microtub its microtubule binding properties in the static image. But you find here that uh, the dynein doesn't really have much of a preference between either of these tracks. It binds to both. So the question is, if we look at this whole complex together, would it look more like dynein, or would it look more like the dynactin molecule? Uh, so we did this, combined the microtubules, and did a motility assay, and the result is quite striking. I think you can see that there are lots of these individual dynein dynactin molecules moving along the tyrosinated microtubules, but there's very little motility occurring on these uh, blue microtubules without the tyrosine. So the motility seems to behave much more like the P150 binding properties than the dynein. Um, so another question is, uh, how, what is the mechanism of how this P150 dynactin is influencing dynein motility? Is it necessary just to initiate the uh, first encounter of the motor with the track? Or is it continuously needed to hold on to the track during processive motility? So we wanted to distinguish between these two possibilities with the following type of experiment. We actually made a chimeric microtubule by fusing uh, a tyrosinated microtubule, again in red, 
with a detyrosinated microtubule uh, in blue, but in this case, it's a continuous track here. And we wanted to know, we know that the dynein didactin will first uh, bind to this tyrosinated track and then move along it, but what happens when it reaches the junction? Is it going to fall off or is it going to continue along the track? And the result is shown here in, in a real movie, and you can follow these spots that are first binding to this red portion, um, and you can see that they move continuously from the red portion into this blue region. So this result indicates that the dynein, uh, the dynactin, is needed to initiate the motility, but once it starts, it can uh, then uh, function without the P150 interaction with the uh, tyrosinated uh, tubulin. So in summary, these experiments provided some clues as to how dynactin might be able to activate dynein motility. So as I just described, um, this microtubule binding domain at P150 seems to play initially an important role in delivering dynein and dynactin to tyrosinated microtubules. Uh, but once this interaction is made and the dynein starts going, uh, the motility doesn't seem to continue to need uh, that microtubule binding interaction. So, but we also think that dynactin is still needed uh, for the process of motion for the continued process of motion. And that may occur through some uh, allosteric activation of dynein by dynactin. Uh, and there's some hints of this from uh, the beautiful cryo-EM work that uh, came from Andrew Carter's lab, but we still uh, really don't understand uh, very much of the details about that allosteric activation mechanism. In addition, there are plenty of remaining open questions uh, in this field. Um, so what I, what I showed you was some uh, in vitro experiments showing that uh, the ty tyrosinated state of a microtubule plays an important role of dynein transport in vitro, but what about in living cells? Uh, are tracts that are uh, detyrosinated, uh, uh, are they poor tracts for dynein motility and perhaps select uh, kinesin-based motility? Um, so there, we, we don't know the answers to these questions about how this uh, cycle of tyrosination and detyrosination is used to regulate uh, uh, microtubule-based transport between dynein and kinesin motors uh, in living cells. We also know that in living cells there are other types of dynein regulators, ones that I haven't had a chance to describe in this talk, but other examples of dynein regulators include this protein uh, called LIS1 which uh, is, was found as a mutation in a disease called uh, lysencephaly. There's also another factor called noodle. Um, and what we don't know is how all of these factors are working together uh, as a system to regulate dynactin motility in cells. So uh, there's still a tremendous amount uh, of work to do to understand uh, the regulation uh, of dynein in, in cells. Um, and I'd like to just to end with acknowledging that the people that did the work that I just described, uh, I already mentioned uh, Rick McKinney, uh, who initiated this whole project. He's uh, now about to start his own lab at UC Davis. Uh, Walter Yoon is a graduate student that did a lot of the work on the other di uh, dynein dynactin adapter proteins. Uh, and Minhaj Sirajudin, uh, uh, former postdoc in the lab. He now has his own lab at the NCBS in Bangalore, and he did a lot of the work on the tubulin that, that I described and, and pioneered a system for making recombinant tubulin. And with that, uh, I'd also like to thank you for your attention.